Breaking news tonight, two bodies found in the search for two Kansas moms who disappear en route to a children's pickup and birthday party. Tonight, four in custody after pools of blood found next to the missing mom's empty car. Good evening. I'm Nancy Grace. Thank you for being with us. Good evening. I'm Nancy Grace, and this is Crime Story. Again, thank you for being with us. In the last hour's breaking news, two bodies have been found in a rural area. We believe at this hour they are the bodies of two missing Kansas moms. The two moms go missing as they are en route to pick up children for a children's birthday party. What more do we know? Take a listen to this. Fifteen days after Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly are reported missing, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation announces the recovery of two bodies. The identity of the remains has not been confirmed as of yet, but we do know the remains have been sent to the Oklahoma Medical Examiner's Office for identification, as well as the cause and manner of death. Those two bodies waiting to be identified at the H Oklahoma morgue. Joining me, an all-star panel to make sense of what we know right now. We are also learning that at this hour, four people in custody. What more do we know? Lauren Conlon joining us, investigative journalist, host of Outlier Podcast at laurenconlon.com. Lauren, thank you for being with us. Tell me about the discovery of the bodies, and we will get to the four defendants behind bars in a moment. But first, these bodies. Do you believe they're the two Kansas moms? Unfortunately, Nancy, I believe they found the bodies of Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly. They did say they found the bodies in Texas County. Three of the people arrested are from Cimarron County. I did find that one of the men arrested, I know you'll get to it, he does own some land in Texas County, a place called Texhoma, Oklahoma. So I guess we'll see. But as soon as the news broke on Saturday that they believed the pools of blood were possibly from the women being shot, immediately when they found these bodies, I thought it was them. Well, here's the other bombshell, in addition to four people being behind bars right now in connection with the discovery of the two bodies. One of those people is one of the women's mother-in-law, a granny. That's right, a mother-in-law behind bars after her daughter-in-law, oops, ouch, not a good shot. After her daughter-in-law, we believe, body is found en route to a kid's birthday party. Joining me, a renowned medical examiner, toxicologist, pathologist, opioid treatment expert, and author of American Narcan, Dr. William Maroney. Dr. Maroney, if these two bodies, and again, everybody, we're going to get to the four people behind bars right now, one of them being one of the victim's mother-in-law. Um, I mean, I know a lot of mothers-in-law don't get along with the daughter-in-law, but really? Now the child is going to be raised without a mother at all? Any mother's better than no mother, many people would argue. But Dr. Maroney, I want to get to the bodies because, Dr. Maroney, this is the key to unsolving this case. What do you make of what Dave Mack just reported that authorities do not believe the two bodies have been exposed to the elements for the entire two weeks the women were missing. What are they talking about? The first thing they're talking about is temperature and humidity. We call weather. If you put a body in moderate weather, it begins to bloat and dry out and there's insect activity. So the lack of bloating the lack of drying and the lack of uh, blow flies suggest the bodies were indoors. They were hidden and uh, maggots, maggots take over in four to five days at 60 to 70 to 75 degrees. Maggots can take a full body down to near skeleton, something that looks like 
an Egyptian mummy. If you have a body and you have facial recognition and you have big muscle mass, that body was in a cooler, that body was in a shed, that body was in a trunk, or that body was wrapped in plastic. Dr. Maroney, I see you have a guest with you today. I believe that is Willow. Why? That's Willow. What can you tell us with Willow? What I want to tell you about with Willow is the emphasis on pools of blood. In a gunshot, you have a penetrating injury that when you have blood, you're going into the body, in deep. We're talking six, seven, eight, ten inches. That's how you get enough blood out of a body with a gunshot. If you had to stab a body with something, you'd need 30 or 40 of these, and you'd have to get people in the groin, here, under the arms, or in the neck. Even if you had a larger knife, you still need 20 or 30 deep wounds to create pools of blood. Two gunshots can give you pools of blood. If they're penetrating... Now you just pointed and, to Willow and you pointed yes. to three separate locations. I assume that you are referring to the carotid, the femoral, and the arm the arm. Bingo. Arteries. Large vessels. That's the only way you can get pools of blood with a knife. With a gun, you can get pools of blood with just two shots. Now, that would be the femoral, which is down uh, on either side down of here. your crotch. It's your leg, major, right. major artery, as big, yeah, as big yeah. or bigger than the carotid artery. That's why, you know, you get bigger. shot in the yeah. leg. You can bleed out just as quickly as you can with the carotid artery. The carotid artery, of course, everyone knows, is uh, the artery leading, I, I, I would say, as a layperson, from the heart to the brain. To the Right, right, right. Okay. And then what was the arm one called? A brachial artery? What is that called? Yes. The brachial artery, the brachial complex, veins, nerves, and arteries. But your big vessels are going to be femoral and in the neck. Otherwise, just one or two gunshots. Guys, the reason we're going into this is because multiple large pools of blood were found around the missing Kansas mom's empty vehicle. So to you, Dr. William Maroney, I want to talk about what evidence we can get from, and, and we fully believe these are the two women's bodies. Okay, you've got two women missing, uh, two bodies are found not too far away in an area where Lauren Conlon pointed out one of the defendants we think owns property nearby and then immediately after the two bodies are found, four people are arrested. Hold on uh, with me, Dr. William Maroney, renowned medical examiner. We're very honored to have him on today. Also joining me right now, Tim Jansen. He's a high-profile former federal prosecutor and analyst for the Tallahassee Democrat. And today he has a special insight on mothers-in-law that kill. He has just finished an extensive analysis regarding the Dan Markle murder. And behind bars right now, as the, um, let me say, puppet master of all that, is Mrs. Adelson, the mother-in-law. Uh, you know, Tim Jansen, I don't believe I've ever seen anything like it where mothers-in-law are so enraged uh, very often over the grandchild. Remember, in the Markle case, uh, Dan Markle, the Florida professor, refused to move so his wife could take another job or relocate near her mother down, I believe it was in Miami or South Miami. And next thing you know, he's dead. And mother-in-law is behind bars. Yeah, it's bad. It, it seems like these parents or grandparents are now going to the second parental stages where the grandchildren are more important than anything in their lives. Looking at this booking photo, it looks like a very troubled, hardened woman who had a difficult life, 
who had these grandchildren and apparently well, hold on. Wait, her boyfriend wait, 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 decided you're taking one look at her skin care and you're saying she had a hard life because I am not buying into that one minute and I don't care how bad her upbringing or her life was which I know nothing about yet that does not excuse double murder Jensen no Tim Jensen I'm very surprised you would even say that no, no, I'm not. She's had I'm a hard life because she's got her. wrinkles? Well, then we're all up the creek I'm, without a paddle. No, what I'm saying is I've seen lots of, of, of photos like this. Um, it's clear that no one should kill anyone. She should turn over the kids. It's clear that the bodies were moved because lack of decompensation. And the police are going to figure it out. They're going to leave some DNA residue. They've got the suspects. Um, it's not a coincidence that these people were missing they were shot in the car, large blood. It's clear. People kill people who they know. This is not a serial murder. And I'm not giving any judgment on whether she did it or didn't do it. I'm just saying that's not a very nice uh, booking photo. Two bodies found in the hunt for Kansas moms who vanished two weeks ago. Police arresting four people for murder and kidnap after, quote, pools of blood were found next to their empty car. Oh, my goodness. Here we go. The hit parade. There they are. You'd think none of them have seen a pair of scissors, and God only knows when. That's a whole nother story. Dr. William Maroney, a renowned medical examiner and author of American Narcan on Amazon. Dr. Maroney, back to the three arteries, femoral, carotid, brachial, Large pools of blood, multiple large pools of blood. And it brings to mind, Dr. William Maroney, uh, Jennifer Dulos, the, miss, the Connecticut missing mother of five. Cops walked into her garage and are like, yes, she's dead because there's so much blood found in her garage. There's no way she could be alive. Now, how does that happen? How much blood does there have to be for you to know the victim is dead? Here's an example um, from one of our local barbecues. This is a gallon. Oh, sorry. This is a liter of iced tea. You can survive. Uh, you won't be able to breathe and you'll have low blood pressure. But this is the limit. This is the threshold of how much blood you have to lose demonstrated as iced tea from my barbecue shop. Uh, something would absolutely call, you would call exsanguination that you're dead would be two full liters, a two liter. Okay, can you what hold I on showed just you a over moment, here. please? Dr. William Maroney, yeah. can you please speak imperial, not metric, not milliliters? Okay, so it's oh. my understanding that one U.S. <laughs> gallon is 0.264 liters. Okay, so yeah, this will be two six about a third, half a gallon, close to a third of a liter. Okay, half uh, a, gallon a third here. of yeah. a gallon. Okay, that's a half a gallon, and you're saying that, you that, will not exsanguinate with a half a gallon. How much do you have to bleed you, to be dead? You will pass gallon? out. Uh, really close. What what do I have on here? Uh, just a little between two and three quarts and you'll pass out and you'll die eventually because you can't get enough oxygen to your brain. So that's the limit is um, less than two quarts, you'll uh, lose consciousness, but you won't die. Uh, two to three quarts, uh, you can't function. Your heart will go into ischemia and you'll have a stroke and your brain won't work. In the last hours, L.A. law enforcement speaks regarding the discovery of two dead bodies, apparently, that had not been out in the elements for the last two weeks, as well as the arrests of four. Listen. We received a call on uh, March 30th of a, an abandoned vehicle missing with persons missing from the vehicle. Uh, deputies immediately responded to the area. Um, when they received, when they uh, arrived on scene, uh, they found some things that just weren't adding up. So we established a crime scene and then notified the OSBI to have them come and, and assist us with this and uh, to actually take lead on the case. All right. uh, we established a 
search party made up of the Gaiman Fire Department and several of the volunteer uh, fire departments in the county. And we searched a, uh, the area around the crime scene for about a mile in each direction. Straight out to James Shellnut joining us. Uh, 27 years, Metro Major Case and former SWAT, now high-profile lawyer, joining us out of Alabama. James, thank you for being with us. When we hear a long line of Texas County Sheriff's SWAT and the OSBI, what does that tell you from your time with SWAT? Well, it tells me two things. Number one, it tells me that they're not going out to do an interview. They've got a warrant in hand. Uh -huh. They're going out to put a pair of handcuffs on somebody that they believe is dangerous. Uh, somebody in this case who has murdered someone and somebody in this case who they feel is a threat even to law enforcement. As a SWAT, a former SWAT member, what do you do in this kind of situation? You're arresting four people. Let's see the four people. So what you do here is, number one, you gain some intelligence on where you're going to. You gain some intelligence on the people, including the backgrounds of these people. Do they have any prior offenses? Or are they known to possess weapons, which obviously a weapon was involved in this type of crime? Uh, so you get some intelligence both on the people you're going to arrest as well as the locations that they may be. And you come up with a game plan and come up with a plan on what each team is going to do and how each team is going to secure the perimeter of the home and then a plan on the actual entry if indeed you have to make an entry into that home. You know what's interesting about what you're saying, Jim Shelnut, James Shelnut, Tim Jansen with me, a former federal prosecutor, analyst, Tallahassee Democrat, is the level of violence that a grandma slash mother-in-law will exceed in order to get that grandchild. Because in both Markle, where the Florida state law professor was murdered, with the grandma, the mother-in-law, pulling the strings, and now in this case, where the mother-in-law slash grandmother is arrested, all it was that day is mommy was picking up the children at a designated location, the Four Corners Trading Company, to go to a kid's birthday party. That's all that was happening. Why do you have to shoot two ladies dead? One you don't even know. Why? Over a birthday party? Well, you know, in the Markell case, it appears that the grandmother was the one initiating the violence and get her, her grandkids back. We don't know enough yet in this case how this transpired, but we know a violent crime occurred in the car. The bodies were moved and they were secreted somewhere for some time period. And then the bodies were placed where they were found. So we don't know exactly what the grandmother's role was, but clearly she's involved in this just like Miss. Uh, Miss Markella, I mean, Miss Adelson was. You know, uh, another issue here, you, you have two locations. This is significant. And, and I want to go to you again, James Shellnut, uh, 27 years Metro Major case and SWAT, now lawyer. Shellnut, we just saw in Sean Puffy Combs, AKA Diddy, simultaneous raids um, going down on two two sides of the country, and it was just very heavily orchestrated and planned ahead of time by the feds. In this case, you've got at least two, if not three, law enforcement LE units together, and they raid two places, make four arrests in two locations. That is a lot of planning and precision timing. Absolutely, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to maintain the element of surprise. You know, when you go to one house where one group of suspects is at, and then there's another group of suspects at another house, you know, you have to anticipate that somebody may call the second group and say, hey, we've got police here, which will give them time enough to possibly arm themselves, possibly time enough to escape. And if it's not the group of suspects, you know, people tend to know their neighbors. Often they have each other's numbers and way to get in touch with each other. So yeah, it's, it's critical uh, both for the safety standpoint of law enforcement serving these warrants, as well as to make sure that the suspects you're looking for aren't tipped off and escape. Lauren Collins joining me, investigative journalist, host of The Outlier. Um, Lauren, thank you for being with us. Explain to me how the arrests go down. Two simultaneous 
arrests in two locations, so four in all. So Tad Cullum and Tiffany Adams, they, they were dating and they were together. He is a known associate of her. I think we all saw this coming from the beginning. And then Cole and Cora Twombly, they are also friends. Now these two supposedly own a, a cattle company. Okay, wait a, a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait. Cole, Earl Twombly and Cora mm -hmm. Twombly, they're more than friends. They've got the same last name. They're, they're married. They're friends with Tiffany and Tad. So those I'm two sorry, they are, yes. Yes, they are married. Friends they of own Tad Cullum and Tiffany Adams. Got it, okay. Yes, yes, exactly. And so I want to add something uh, that there was a scheduled hearing for custody on April 17th, 2024, where Veronica Butler was petitioning to have overnight visits, unsupervised visits, and overall increased visits with her children. And it was very clear Tiffany Adams did not like this. She actually had her son uh, relinquish parental rights and threw her son under the bus and saying, look, Veronica took advantage of the fact that my son was into partying and drugs and didn't seem to care about caring for his children anymore. So she swooped in and all of a sudden wanted these additional visits. I totally geared off what you asked. I just had to add all that, but but I can give you more context hey, wait, wait, on wait, the wait. board. I, I wanna hear more about what you're saying. Lauren Conlon joining me, investigative journalist. You're saying that the grandma, let's see the grandma. Grandma's Tiffany Adams, age 54. Also mother-in-law to one of the victims, Veronica Butler. This is the mother-in-law. And when her own son was fighting for custody, she swoops in, backstabs her own son so she, the grandma, can get custody? Yes, and let me let me point this out. This could be nothing, but I thought the timing was very, very odd. So when she is filing a motion, uh, or, or I think it was, it was November 15th, she filed a motion for continuance. The next day, her son is booked and arrested on a firearm charge having a firearm after committing a felony. And I thought to myself, did she turn her own son in so he wouldn't have to be a part of any of this? That, that occurred to me, is she that calculated? Is she that devious? And I think she was. Breaking news tonight, four people now behind bars in connection with the disappearance of two Kansas moms. Their bodies found in Texas County, Oklahoma, in a very, very rural area. Dr. William Maroney, renowned medical examiner, joining us. Uh, I'm not sure I'm buying into the theory the bodies had not been exposed to the elements. Uh, we're not going to really know anything until we hear from the medical examiner. If the bodies had been exposed to the elements, and I believe it was 54 degree weather, but it's, it fluctuates. What would you expect to find, Dr. Maroney? 54 degrees is the lower limit of almost normal ambient outdoor. You would definitely see blowflies and maggots eating away at masses of protein and muscle. They start in the mouth, they go to the ears, they come out of the eyes. You'd lose the heads right away. And then um, they kind of go to the groin, they go to the rectum, and then they eat upwards, and the rest of the body would bloat. And when it gets really hot, it's too hot for maggots. So um, it, you have to be, you have to have this window. So we'll see if these bodies come back with maggot activity, then they've been working on them for a long time. You know, another issue is how are the bodies going to be identified? I guess if they have decomposed to a certain point, they'll have to be identified by either dental records, like uh, cavities in a certain spot, um, implants, braces, or DNA. Also, if the bodies are decomposed, and this is very critical, Dr. Maroney, how will you figure out COD cause of death? I guess what you're looking for is full body x-rays to look for rounds shotguns 45s nine millimeters and the 
what we've been leaning with with our local um, Michigan State Police is that DNA is good, but it takes a long time. And if you've got a good forensic dentist, you can identify a body in a day or two. So dental records, which people always thought was kind of slow and archaic, actually are very fast and they're a lot faster than DNA. DNA is precise, but it takes a long time. So and these are young people. These are young people in situations where they'll have fillings or they'll have other dental work or, um, you know, maybe some bridges or some veneers. Very uh, popular things now are um, the, the treatments and the cosmetic dentistry is so much more involved now than it was 20 years ago. So you can absolutely identify through dental records. And another thing, if the bodies have been decomposed to, to such an extent that you're describing, you recall Gabby Petito, who had been, uh, her remains lying out in a dispersed camping out west. Um, so much animal activity had occurred, they identified her originally by the sweatshirt that she was wearing. So right. sometimes we're at that point until we can get DNA, Dr. Maroney. Yeah, I, what we've seen in bodies that have been exposed for more than two weeks with animal activity is that sometimes you have to be careful that marks on bones and the skull are animals gnawing and not um, assault. But the uh, dental records, uh, they're so solid. If you can get back and look, uh, teenage dental records and, and other things, they last for a long time, and they're so much faster than DNA. Yeah, the temperatures went up, I believe, into the 70s. So I, I don't know what effect that's going to have on the bodies, but once animal activity is factored in, it's going to be really hard. So what more do we know about potential motive? Take a listen to Crime Online's Dave Mack. News reports say 10 days before the moms went missing, Veronica Butler filed a court petition for full custody of her children. Currently, Butler's former mother-in-law is the children's guardian. Crime Stories has not yet been able to independently verify the petition. KSN TV also requested the document, but we're told the document is now sealed. The order sealing and restricting the case was sealed after the women went missing to, quote, protect the integrity of a criminal investigation and to protect minor children. The information on who asked for the document to be sealed is also sealed. James Shelnut joining us uh, from the Shelnut Law Firm, along with Tim Jansen joining us out of uh, Florida. J James Shelnut, the timing here, the records regarding those custody issues were sealed when the mom and her friend go missing. I find that very probative. It proves to me that that is the motive. They're sealing the custody records, I believe, because that's the motive. Absolutely. Well, it's a basic statistical fact that most people are killed when they're victims of homicide by people that they know. And then you look out of the people that they know that are closest to them and you say, okay, well, well who has a motive? You know, there, it doesn't get to be a much stronger motive than fighting over custody of kids. We've seen it time and time again. Guys, in the last hours, law enforcement, LE, breaks their silence. Listen. On Friday, the informations were filed and they were filed under seal. The reason they were filed under seal was to protect our law enforcement officers and to try to keep the children out of harm's way. We were successful. No shots were fired and the children were kept out of harm's way. Our district judge issued an order this morning and those files are now unsealed. So you can get the information at the courthouse, you can get the affidavits at the courthouse, which will give you, uh, give you the facts that we were working off of. Welcome back. Breaking news tonight. Four people now behind bars in connection with the disappearance of two Kansas moms on their way to pick up children for a kid's birthday party. These are the four to whom I am referring. Tim Jansen joining me, high profile former federal prosecutor, now analyst with the Tallahassee Democrat. Tim, again, 
the potential motive of custody, but not from a parent, from a mother-in-law. I, I find that very unusual that you would resort to murder, double murder, to keep custody of your grandchild. Yeah, it's troubling that, that a grandparent would assume and commit crimes to keep custody of a grandchild. You know, there's lots of reasons why. They could be financially benefiting if the kids are getting social security or if they're getting child support or if it's just the grandmother has grown a bond of this, these grandchildren and they'll revert to anything. If they think they're gonna lose a court case or if they have lost a court case, it clearly shows a motive and the timing is not just a coincidence. It's very troubling. Guys, in the last hours, law enforcement has spoken. Listen. We received several tips throughout this entire process. Um, the public, I mean, I know that we had thanked what, um, that our local law enforcement agencies, what they were able to help us and throughout this search, but the people here throughout this area have done a tremendous job of reaching out to us. The original press release that we had put out on March 31st um, in regards to searching for these uh, two women, we constantly received several tips and had used those throughout the entire 14 day process um, in order to, to find these two um, bodies and then also um, discover and find those who were responsible um, for this crime. Joining me now is a renowned psychologist, TV radio trauma expert, Karen Stark. You can find her at karenstark.com. That's Karen with a C. Karen Stark, grandparents, mothers-in-law, the bad blood between the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law, I've never seen anything like it. And as you know, I'm super blessed because my mother-in-law was a saint. Can you believe in all the years we never had one crossword ever? Not even once, Karen Stark. Apparently not the case here. You are very lucky, Nancy, because we know so many stories about mother-in-laws and their daughter-in-laws and the conflict that they get into or with son-in-laws. There's a lot of in-law problems. But this case is extreme because you have a mother-in-law who is obsessed with the children. In some ways, she's delusional, Nancy, because it's as though these are her children, as though she gave birth to them. And she will do anything like a mama bear to protect them and make sure that their mother or their father can't get their hands on them. And that is not what you normally find. So you know that there's a problem. There's something with this woman. And think about the fact that she was able to, in some way, enlist the aid in a way of, of these other people to help her and convince them that she had to have these children, without a doubt, they had to be under her care. There's, that's as extreme as I've ever heard, as extreme as you can get. True obsession. You know, Karen Stark, you're bringing up a really good point. It's not just the mother-in-law, the grandma to the children. Lauren Conlon, Karen Stark is right. If police are correct, this mother-in-law had to convince three other people to help her commit double murder. Who are these right. people? Yeah, absolutely. So I want to go back to 2022. Uh, Tad Cullum used to employ her son, Wrangler Rickman, on his farm. And Tad spoke on behalf of Wrangler in 2022 when he was trying to get his children back. He said, this man is amazing to his kids. He's a great father and he deserves to have them back. At this point, Tad had never been arrested. I did see that there was an arrest in 2023 uh, for feloniously pointing a firearm. And going over to Cole Twombly, he also served 11 months at the Department of Corrections in Texas for uh, a deadly conduct charge, which is a misdemeanor. So it's, it's really sad that this woman seems to have this power over these people. I don't know uh, their level of intelligence. I don't really know much about them besides their job. The one thing that I find to be very calculated by Tiffany is that I believe this was planned. She had one 
court appointed supervisor whose name is Cheryl Brune that was basically had not missed a visit with these children in months. And then all of a sudden on March 30th, Cheryl Brune maybe is told not to come or maybe, you know, she calls in sick. I have no idea. And then Jillian Kelly steps in. So it's completely heartbreaking. This is what I understand. We're wondering how the grandma exercised mind control over the other three. I know that the grandma, Tiffany Adams, was in a love relationship with Tad Burt Cullum. Uh, the two were romantically linked. What, what do we know about that? Yeah, they've, they've been dating for a while. And I, I do have some local sources that say that Tiffany is scary. And it's very well known in that town. I believe you mentioned it's a really small town of 20,000 people. So she does exercise this control over many, including her boyfriend, Tad Cullum. So I have no doubt she was able to coerce him very easily. And my local source also said, and I chose not to report on this because I didn't have a police report, but my local source says she witnessed with her own eyes in 2021, Tiffany Adams actually shove Veronica Butler against a car at a children's sports game. Wow, no love lost there. And now the victim, Veronica Butler, age 27, and friend, acquaintance Jillian Kelly, age 39, the preacher's wife, both dead. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm thinking about, uh, to James Shelnut, the fact that these four have been booked on suspicion of murder. Once DNA comes back, I'm pretty sure those charges are going to be upgraded to murder. What type of evidence are police looking for to upgrade that book in charge to murder. Of course, there's going to be an indictment, but until then, what kind of evidence are they trying to glean to upgrade this, kick it up to full on murder one? Well, well there's a smorgasbord of evidence that they could rely on. You know, number one, they could rely on for forensic evidence, you know, whose prints were in the car, if any were recovered. Uh, was there any DNA transfer? Uh, whose property uh, were, were these bodies found on? Uh, you know, one of the things that I would be doing as a detective right now is I'd be looking at the person most likely to flip in this scenario and turn on the others. I think that that would be a great route for law enforcement to proceed if they haven't already. Welcome back. Breaking news tonight. Four people arrested in connection with the disappearance of two Kansas moms. Straight back out to James Shelnut, 27 years, Metro major case, former SWAT, now high-profile lawyer at the Shelnut Law Firm. James Shelnut, you said you believe that one of the four defendants is going to be flipped. I say H-E-L-L-N-O. I wouldn't take a deal, even though I firmly believe sometimes you got to go to hell to get your witness to put the devil in jail, not this time, oh no. Because from what I'm hearing from Dr. William Maroney, this crime scene is going to be rife with evidence. Um, there is going to be a lot of planning, text messages, because this was an a, a agreed upon pickup by the bio mom for a kid's birthday party she was going to throw for her child. This was planned a long time ago. You know there's going to be text messages, phone calls. Those cell phones are going to be traced right back to the area where the women, the two victims, were either murdered or where their bodies were disposed. I would not take a deal from any of them. You say flip is the word. I say stew. What do I mean by that? I would put all four of them in the same pot to stew. Do you, shell nut? Well, I, I agree that that's exactly what they deserve. You know, one of the dumb things that criminals do sometimes is talk. And, you know, when the police get them in there, the detectives start talking with them, you know, it's not always that they have to promise some type of deal to get a statement. Um, you know, people talk to the police all the time. People give confessions all the time. Sometimes they want to downplay what their role is. And so there doesn't always have to be a deal on the table for a suspect to talk in a homicide investigation. 
Joining me, renowned psychologist Karen Stark, joining us from Manhattan. Karen Stark, he's right. Uh, loose lips sink ships. Thank heaven for prosecutors. Another thing that I love uh, is when defendants talk on the jail phone because all of that's being recorded. Um, uh, just recently, Karen, you and I were talking about the Crumley case. Ethan Crumley, a notorious school shooter, in a historic jury decision, both of his parents were held liable, convicted on homicide for enabling their son to be a mass shooter. And of course, you hear the father behind bars on a phone call going, F the prosecutor, I'm going to F her up and making plans to get back and seek revenge, possibly kill the lady prosecutor, the elected district attorney. Keep talking, man. Uh, and then, of course, we saw on video, in color, taught mom Casey Anthony completely Just cursing thinking out of that. Right. her parents when they, yeah, when they dared to say, hey, where's Kelly? And she tore them a new one. And in that jurisdiction, which was Florida, you have not only the the audio, you could see Tot Mom Casey Anthony uh, acting much differently than the facade she presented in court, Karen Stark. So talk, yeah, they're talking. And I think these people, without a doubt, you're right, Nancy, they will talk because they have a previous history with the law. And even though they've been influenced by this woman brainwashed to some extent, they are not wise enough. They love to be in trouble in a way. That's their lifestyle. They will talk. I have no doubt about it. They will reveal what happened, even though it gets them in trouble because they can't shut up. They really can't. So either they'll do it on the phone or with the, with the law. They're going to talk to somebody. I'm convinced. We wait as justice unfolds. Let's stop to remember American hero, police officer Jorge Ignacio Pastore, just 38, shot in the line of duty, Austin. Pastore leaves behind his wife, Kim, stepchildren, Connor, Trevor, and Taylor. American hero, officer Jorge Ignacio Pastore. A big thank you to our guest tonight, but especially to you for being with us tonight and every night. Nancy Grace signing off. I'll see you tomorrow night, 6 and 9 o'clock sharp Eastern. And until then, good night, friend.